You've made your plans and executed them. Your big plans to industrialize your workers and collectivize your farms. But things go against you. Your internal policies work against you. Your external policies work against you. Nature works against you until your agricultural plans have resulted in famine. And what do you do then? You make it worse. You make it a famine of absolute nightmarish proportions. You are Joseph Stalin and it is the Holodomor. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. It was as part of his first five-year plan that Stalin and his government collectivized the farms of the Soviet Union. We've already done an episode about that five-year plan. This is about the agricultural and some of the social effects. Now. We're going to talk about the Holodomor, and before we do that, we need to understand a few things about the historiography. Until just before the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the events I will cover today were known only from anecdotal and eyewitness accounts. Starting already immediately in the 1930s, the Soviets went to extreme lengths to cover up what had actually happened. Even knowing where any of the mass graves of the countless victims were could get you killed, which is, exactly what happened to the entire staff of the Lukianivska Cemetery in Kiev, who were rounded up, tried on trumped-up charges of treason, and shot in 1938. Since the admittance by the Secretary General of the USSR, Mikhail Gorbachev, that this happened in the late 1980s, the opening of the Soviet archives, and the independence of Ukraine, these events have been researched extensively and in extreme detail. And yet, today, in 2019, it is sometimes publicly debated whether the Ukrainian famine of 1932 and 33 was an act of genocide by starvation or the collateral damage of a plan gone wrong. Among most historians, both in the East and the West, there is today little doubt, if any, that it was a deliberate act initiated by Joseph Stalin to use the already dire situation created by the five-year plan to get rid of what he perceived as a threat of renewed nationalist dissent in Ukraine. Much like Adolf Hitler will later do with the Holocaust, Stalin never issued a direct order to starve the Ukrainian farmers to death. Much like the Nazis, the communists used euphemisms and convoluted sanitized language in their communication about the famine. And still, the events speak for themselves. The immense disproportion between deaths in Ukraine and areas in Russia with mostly ethnic Ukrainians against the deaths in the rest of the USSR is staggering. Proportionally more than 10 times as many peasants died in the Ukrainian regions. The gradual increase of oppression and suppression of Ukrainian culture is exactly parallel to the increasing measures that lead to the famine. The repeated refusal to send relief to Ukraine despite calls even by Soviet officials to do so while relief is being sent to other regions. Finally, there is what some historians consider the smoking gun. The telegram sent by Stalin to the Ukrainian Communist Party January 1st, 1933, demanding that they enforce with prejudice and with full force the August 7th, 1932 edict that made even hiding grain for your own consumption a capital crime. Now, you can ask questions, you can present sources, and you can discuss this in the comments if you like. But remember, the blanket denial of these events will not be tolerated under our videos. If you have any doubt in your mind about this, we recommend that you read Anne Applebaum's award-winning book, Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine. It is a detailed, unbiased, but terrifying blow-by-blow -blow account of what we historians now know happened. In any case, Soviet farms had until the mid and late 20s been small individual farms, mostly just doing subsistence farming. In other words, growing enough food for the farmers living on that particular plot of land to survive. But a big hope of the five-year plan is to combine many of these small farms into larger consolidated ones, collective farms, where agricultural machinery like tractors could improve crop yields and feed the whole nation. Individually, Soviet farmers are too poor to invest in such equipment. But if hundreds or thousands of them can share such things paid for by the state, 
agricultural output should increase dramatically. In reality, this turns out not to be the case. With the elimination of the new economic policy once Stalin came to power, which we talked about in the five-year plan episode, and the consequent elimination of the autonomy of the peasants in favor of collectivization, resistance against the Soviet government grows. And by collectivization, I mean that all farmlands, cattle, and equipment were to become government property. This is a fairly good thing for the poorer peasants, but not at all for the wealthier ones. They certainly don't want to suddenly give away everything they own. In protest, many of them slaughter their livestock and burn their fields. Livestock populations sink to half what they had been in the 20s by 1933, which, other than the food industry, affects other industries like leather and wool, causing shortages. There are riots and acts of sabotage. So, collectivization can only be just one part of Stalin's twofold plan here. The more ideological part of the agricultural transformation of the Soviet Union then must be the policy of liquidating the kulaks as a class. The kulaks were those peasants who were, or were seen as, more affluent than others and thereby constituted a social class of their own, those wealthier peasants. However, the definition of kulak was often loosely defined and eventually became used as a flexible excuse for crackdown by Soviet authorities. At times, the definition could even mean simply having more cattle than a neighbor. But it was soon often applied to peasants who were unwilling to hand over their grain to the government, which became the only authorized purchaser of agricultural goods. Beginning in 1929, kulaks are further defined and given particular characteristics. The Ukrainian Council of People's Commissars, for example, issues a decree with a list of symptoms that may apply to Kulak farms. Among these are the capability of hiring labor, having an industrial component like a tannery or a mill, or having owners who had an unearned income, perhaps through trade or money lending. The liquidation of the kulaks is a policy set by Moscow but implemented by local officials. And just like the five-year plan as a whole, the kulak question is often settled by the establishment of quotas. The figures are set by the secret police, the Joint State Political Directorate, OGPU. So the growing demands made by Moscow result in anti-kulak rhetoric ratcheting up over time. For example, in January 1930, an OGPU agent uses the term Kulak White Guard Bandits, branding them as enemies of the people, not simply as class enemies as originally conceived. Being labeled a Kulak is soon a social death sentence, resulting in the loss of property and legal rights. Homes and clothing belonging to Kulaks are confiscated and even spontaneously auctioned off, while their lands are incorporated into large collective farms. More and more often, it is not just a social death sentence, but an actual death sentence. Two million kulaks are resettled elsewhere, particularly in northern Russia, Central Asia, Siberia, and regions seen as underpopulated. Many die during the travel or the first winter in their new home, since few, if any, provisions have been made for them. They are sometimes simply dumped without food or shelter in a field or forest. Beyond the issues with kulaks and collectivization, the Soviet Union has natural issues as well. Russia and the USSR has always had a history of recurrent droughts. In the summer of 1921, for example, as much as a quarter of all grain withered away during a drought that affected roughly half of all food producing regions. In 1931, parts of the country are now again affected by drought. But this also negatively affects other regions. In October, People's Commissar for External and Internal Trade Anastas Mikoyan issues a declaration calling for that year's production quotas to still be met in spite of the drought. This is to be achieved by increasing the expectations from non-affected areas. Expectations which are already often impossible to meet, especially with the kulaks and their labor now gone. On top of this, Soviet Union had already increased grain exports since they are a means to accumulate the hard currency necessary to purchase foreign goods like weapons or the machinery needed for the five-year plan. Just from 1929 to 31, German imports of Soviet grain tripled. Britain imported 26,799 tons of Soviet wheat in 1924. By 1927, it was five times that, 
138,486 tons. By virtue of being the sole communist country on Earth, the Soviet Union ended up exporting to a whole political spectrum of countries, from democratic Netherlands to fascist Italy. But the five-year plan not only needs to further increase exports to get more hard currency, concerns about the risk of American saturation of the grain market lead Stalin to write to Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov in July 1930 that they must force the export of grain. That is the key. While some economists advise that Stalin wait for prices to rise before exporting more, their advice is rejected on the basis that the need for hard currency is urgent and that without any currency reserves, there is no time to wait. Grain exports go from 170,000 tons in 1929 to 4.8 million in 1930 to 5.2 million in 1931. That is a 30-fold increase in two years. There is some awareness within the Soviet leadership about the need to limit exports. Molotov recommends offering relief to Ukraine, and Lazar Kaganovich, with Molotov in charge of implementing collectivization, acknowledges that Ukraine will suffer from shortages in 1932, though he does not propose how to fix that. Some food relief is sent to urban Ukrainian areas like Kiev and Odessa. But in the summer of 1932, Stanislav Kosior, Ukrainian Communist Party secretary, informs local Ukrainian party leaders that just 20 districts of a total of 600 will get any sort of relief. And the export of grain is enforced by Ukrainian officials who are told things like they will be made personally responsible for the export of rye from the Odessa port. So, the exports and the requisitions have led to shortages for the locals. And when you combine that with a drought, you get famine. The Soviet authorities institute a series of policies intended to contribute to requisitioning, which also contribute to the worsening of the famine. In November and December 1932 comes the issuance of Chornadoshka, blacklists, or literally blackboards, which list individuals and villages that are insufficiently productive. This is also a ban on private trade of goods between farmers. The state is the only authorized purchaser of farm production, but there had been plenty of small-scale local trade going on anyhow. The new edict results in a total ban on trade of meats and farm goods between farmers and farms if they are unable to meet their production quota. This is extended to flour and even to seeds, and this policy is strictly enforced by local police, effectively dooming Ukrainian farmers living on underproducing farms, which is most of them because of the wildly unrealistic quotas and the lack of manpower. And the famine becomes the horror of the Holodomor, which means death or murder by starvation, from the Ukrainian words holod for starvation or famine and moriti to cause death. The absence of any food surplus and then any food at all because of requisitioning and lack of relief results in starvation and total desperation. Peasants, with no other alternatives, eventually resort to eating dogs, rats, or insects. Boiling grass is not uncommon. There are cases of cannibalism. For millions of people, there is no hope of survival, and they die one of the cruelest deaths there is, death by starvation. A Soviet official who works in Ukraine on the confiscation policy has this to say, all alike, their heads like heavy kernels, their necks skinny as a stork's, every bone movement visible beneath the skin on the arms and legs, the skin itself like yellow gauze stretched over their skeletons, and the faces of those children were old, exhausted, as if they had already lived on the earth for 70 years, and their eyes, Lord. The roads leading to Donbass are described by a lucky survivor. Dead villagers lay on the roads, along the road and paths. There were more bodies than people to move them. Government forces also actively prevent rural peasants from trying to escape the horror by fleeing to a city or town. You are stuck in the countryside and you have no food and no real hope of food. Vasily Grossman, Red Army World War II correspondent and novelist, writes in Everything Flows, and we all thought, that no fate could be worse than that of the Kulaks. How wrong we were. 
After the dispossession of the Kulaks, the area of land under cultivation dropped sharply, and so did the crop yield. Our village was given a quota it could not have fulfilled in 10 years. Everyone understood very well. If you fail to fulfill the plan, you are a Kulak yourself, and you should have been liquidated long ago. Starvation also impacts the ability to digest food, which results in some people dying from the act of eating itself, even when they do manage to find food. The hunger also affects the psychological state of being, destroying group bonds such as those of the family. There are many cases of family members kicked out of their houses because of the lack of food. Often, there is a reduced response to the death of relatives. This results in parents taking food from their children or committing infanticide in extreme cases. Paranoia and suspicion between starving neighbors becomes the norm. Iarna Mitzik notes that while families had often kept their doors unlocked even during the revolution and the civil war, they stopped doing so during the famine. Ukraine is the place most identified with the Holodomor. Well, Ukraine is the most agricultural part of the Soviet Union and has a proportionally larger peasant population and was traditionally the breadbasket of the Russian Empire. And many authorities in Moscow also view Ukrainian peasants as the greatest potential internal political threat to the state. And if the famine happens to neutralize that threat, so be it. But Ukraine is not the only area to experience famine and suffering. Central Asia also experiences collectivization and hunger, food shortages, child starvation, laborers too weak to work, and a slow, agonizing death are seen in places like Kazakhstan, the Volga region, and beyond. Actually, the famine is catastrophic for the Kazakhs. Soviet policies of requisitioning and forced settlement have a devastating impact on Kazakh nomads, with approximately one-third dying while at the same time having little impact on Slavs in the Kazakh ASSR. According to some historians, this is part of a wider effort at Sovietization. Resistance anywhere to the government policies is pronounced counter-revolutionary or anti-Soviet. The Red Army is sent to suppress such anti-government actions. And the concern that Ukrainian national identity can contribute to the downfall of the Soviet Union has far-reaching effects. Decrees intended to combat Ukrainianization are not limited to Ukraine, but also the Northern Caucasus and Central Asia, both of which have a significant Ukrainian presence. Ukrainian cultural institutions are closed down, Ukrainian language newspapers are forcibly shut down, and so forth. This is a reversal of earlier Soviet policies that permitted multilingualism and even encouraged multiculturalism. In 1920, Lenin sent a telegram to Stalin instructing him to hire Ukrainian interpreters for the Red Army and to permit the use of Ukrainian on official documents in order not to lose Ukraine. So that's gone 180 degrees in the opposite direction. The exact number of people who died in the Holodomor has been estimated with low-end and high-end estimates between 1.5 million to as many as 10 million deaths. Different regions have differing practices in terms of record keeping. And you cannot always differentiate between who emigrated, who died, who moved within a region, who was sent to prison, who died in transit, and who was forcibly resettled. Also, although records are kept fairly accurately in 1933, future Soviet demographers will falsify records in order to minimize the number of deaths reported. Recent studies, have used cross-referencing to zero in on a number that is now accepted as very close to accurate. 3.7 million deaths in Ukraine and about 800,000 in the rest of the USSR, bringing the total figure to 4.5 million women, men, and children killed. But you just have to look at the famine's effect on life expectancy to get a feeling. Before 1932, urban Ukrainian men had an average life expectancy of 40 to 46 years. For rural men, it was 42 to 44 years. For those born in the year 1932, this is just 30 years. And for those born in 1933, the average life expectancy is five years, regardless if one is from the city or the countryside. Five 
years. By May 1933, the Kremlin authorizes food relief to Ukraine. There is also a shift away from a requisition quota towards a tax on the total harvest, though this will be applied unevenly. There is also a decrease in the number of arrests, partially because of the difficulty of imprisoning the hundreds of thousands already in detention, but also as a general policy change in order to have sufficient manpower for future harvests. In October 1933, Kosior requests a reduction in Ukraine's grain target for the following year. This is approved, and the famine, the Holodomor, will end. Collectivization, the famine, even the five-year plan. You can look at these and say that this was a war by Joseph Stalin's government against the people of the Soviet Union. He had defeated his political enemies in the late 1920s but he still had, in theory, internal ones. The kulaks, the wealthier farmers unwilling to bow to collectivization, they are now gone. The ethnic minorities like the Kazakhs and Ukrainians that may threaten his state, they are annihilated and neutralized by the famine. And Stalin now has hard currency from exports to equip his army, the army that brutally suppresses any local dissent or uprising. But as the decade unfolds, Stalin will realize that the only possible remaining internal threat left to his power is that army. And yet he will need that army if he is to expand his power and influence to the former territories of the Tsarist Empire, to East Asia and beyond. And that dichotomy will guide his actions and his thoughts as his regime becomes ever more paranoid, ever more ruthless, and ever closer to violent conflict with the outside world. If you would like to learn more about why Stalin was so worried about Ukraine, check out our episode about the Polish-Soviet War and the attempts of the Ukraine to stay independent right here. Our patron of the week is Deborah Kirshner. Thanks to Deborah and the Time Ghost Army, we can make more videos just like this. Do not forget to subscribe and uh, see you next time.